everyone, my name is Sean Shaw and this is Vanguards of Democracy. Today's episode puts political division under a microscope, not to exacerbate it, but to heal it. Reverend J.C. Pritchett, president of the Suncoast Tiger Bay Club, will be here to share the successes of the Tiger Bay Club's nonpartisan political discourse model. But first, I'm connected by Zoom with another one of my good friends, Aramis Ayala, to learn about her campaign for Florida Attorney General and some of the philosophies she intends to run on. Those interviews start right now, so stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of Vanguards of Democracy here with Sean Shaw, and I'm here with someone that uh, is an amazing candidate for Attorney General here in the state of Florida. That's Aramis Ayala. Uh, Aramis, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Aramis is a personal friend of mine. We've had good friends on the show today. Aramis is one of them. Aramis was the first African-American state attorney elected here in the state of Florida. It was from, um, what circuit is that? The Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit and Aramis. Uh, I want you to talk about this, but I was drawn to Aramis and I kind of became acquainted with Aramis personally because of her stance on the death penalty. Uh, and it's very similar to mine. Uh, and uh, we got along great after that. Aramis, talk about your time and election as state attorney, and then I'm going to move to the attorney general stuff pretty quick. But I, because it was so historic, and it was so amazing, uh, your election as state attorney. And then I want you to talk about the death penalty component and the, the governor punishing you. And, you know, uh, we were we, the Black Caucus tried to do what we could, but it was it was a lot going on there. But uh, that that's why I think you are uniquely qualified to run for what you're running for. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Sean. I, I appreciate you sharing this uh, platform and uh, for the, the the blazing of trailing that you did yourself. Um, I ran for state attorney in uh, 2016, and I was elected, took office in 2017, and as you said, served as the first African-American state attorney in the state of Florida. Now, we often talk about being the first, you know, the first woman, the first um, Black person, the first this, and I, I, that's always makes you proud, but if you're only doing it to pad your resume and your image, and you're not bringing all of your life experience there, then it is absolutely worth nothing. So as an assistant public defender, as an assistant state attorney, as a law professor, as a person who has done legal analysis, the first issue that I addressed was the death penalty. And what I had done is during my uh, campaign, I promised that I would look at the, the evidence. I promised to be an attorney, which is what we should be, and never engage in politics. And when I made my decision about the death penalty, the, the, there's two things that I, I always have to correct people on. Number one, I didn't make any promises about the death penalty when I ran, because as you know, Sean, it had been declared unconstitutional twice in less than two years by both the United States Supreme Court and the Florida Supreme Court. So that was never an issue when I was running. The second thing is that these aren't my feelings. These are the facts. When you look at death penalty in the state of Florida, Let's start with its, its deterrent effect. Should we be doing it? Death penalty is not a deterrent to crime. As a matter of fact, the states that have the death penalty have higher uh, homicide rates than the states that don't. We often um, acknowledge the racial disparities, but those are also very real. And um, most importantly, uh, well, I should say not most importantly, of significant importance is we get it wrong. Florida leads the nation in death row exonerations, and that is not a, um, a comfortable title that we should have and that we shouldn't be looking back on it. But the one that was most um, profound to me was that those who are for the death penalty often say that they're fiscally responsible. In the state of Florida, we spend $51 million to keep the death penalty on the books, and that is above what we would do on a life sentence without the possibility of parole. So if we converted all death sentences to um, a life without parole, they still die in prison, we would save and increase our budget $51 million every single year. So when I looked at that, I was like, then where's the justice? I took an oath to follow the law, but I also took an oath to pursue justice and I couldn't find any justice in the death penalty. And I made a decision. You know, people are, well, why did you tell? Why did you say? Because we say we want transparency in government, but when you get it, you have a problem with it. So I believe in being who I say I am, doing the work, and I have absolutely no regret. The governor, he um, decided that um, I got out of line, um, that I wasn't where I should be uh, as a woman, as a black person in the state of Florida, and he attempted to um, manage and control that. 
um, while he did take away multiple cases, I can assure you that didn't stop the reform movements that I made. I still went forward with bail reform in the state of Florida. I still instituted unprecedented uh, diversion programs for people who were being stopped unjustly by police and charged with resisting officers without arrest. I was still able to create drug rehabilitation diversion programs as well. We created conviction integrity unit that actually saved people from deportation. We did a lot while I was the state attorney, despite the efforts of the governor to try to silence us. I stand strong on the work that we did, and I'm ready to build upon it. The To, to uh, condense your remarks, the death penalty is racist. It's sexist. It is classist. It is not a deterrent, uh, and it is expensive. Uh, and I, I, for those reasons, I am uh, extremely anti-death penalty. And lastly, in an imperfect criminal justice system, we should not be exacting the ultimate punishment. Um, and that is what we do in this state. And as you said, your history of exonerations, it, it, it's just, it's not, we shouldn't be doing that. And I, I often am amazed that those who call themselves pro-life uh, often are the biggest supporters of the death penalty. Uh, either you're pro-life or you're not. Uh, you know, so Sean, another thing that I that we don't talk about is the PTSD associated with it. When mm -hmm. you do the interviews and the people have to carry it out, let's not let's not forget that. Somebody got to push the button or pull the lever. Um, and uh, so at, at when when you made uh, the announcement about your death penalty stance, and I I know it became it became a huge thing. Rick Scott was the governor at the time, and uh, I became kind of involved personally because I was involved in some of the press conferences the Black Caucus did um, because it, obviously there was a racial component uh, in how you were being attacked. It was overt. It was not subtle. There was an overt racial component to it, but also, like I said, I believe that the death penalty is all those things I said, all those things you said, and it, it we're a better we are more civilized than someone who should be imposing uh, electrocuting or stabbing someone with poisonous chemicals to kill them. Um, so uh, after that, uh, talk about your journey to the attorney general's race here and, and uh, what we got going on. Sean, I thought I was done. You know, I had done the you work. You told me I, you were done because I was trying <laughs> to get you. To, I was trying to get you to do it. You told me you were done. I did. I looked you right <laughs> in your face and was like, "Yeah, no, that's not happening." <laughs> um, I, 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 it has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with a voice that you have. There's something in you that you know that people need representation. And when I consider the congressional race, you know, getting involved in establishing legislation, that was an idea. But the truth is this past legislative session, if we are still sitting silent, there is a problem inside of us. Um, I, I, I left the state attorney's office um, and I thought I'd left politics. I, I joined the University of Central Florida's uh, faculty as a full-time professor there. And I was teaching my students about unconstitutional laws while I'm using examples of what is happening in the, legisl in the legislature. And I'm like, I can teach about it or I can do something about it. And I continue to teach, but then I threw my, my, my name in and I'm like, we're going all the way because there's no way that the people of the state of Florida should have an attorney but they don't know who she is. They don't know what she what she's done. And even when they dig, they can't identify what she has done. We have a microcosm of what we saw with Donald Trump in Sessions and Barr. Right here in the state of Florida, Ronald, Ron DeSantis has his own personal attorney instead of the person who's supposed to be the people's attorney fighting for the people. You know, if you look at, you know, her behavior with Amendment 4, that's what the people voted for, to, to restore the rights of formerly incarcerated people. When you look at the fair districts in 2010, that's what the people voted for. And she's going against that. When you look at the things that the people have said they want to happen, unfortunately, she is siding with the governor. Tell me what you want to do. That You're, you're elected attorney general here in November. What do you intend to do? From, and I mean from uh, the office and who maybe is employed there all the way up to what you intend to do in terms of investigations and, and bringing the hammer down where it needs to be brought. So I think that it's important to recognize those who are employed by that have to reflect the voice of the people and not the voice of the powerful elite. And that is important for those who work there. So, um, yeah, we're going to look at addressing the culture because we've never had access to this office. And when we get it, we better do it right. That's the first part. When it comes substantively, you know, Sean, you talked about it. The, the decimation of the civil rights unit um, right there in the attorney general office is, is something that we cannot stand for. There are too many 
many civil rights violations happening to people. Um, it, it, there's police misconduct. Um, all the things that we should be investigating need to be part of it. We need to be part of the right lawsuits. You know, we've got the Everglades. We've got federal violations for environment that are happening. We need to engage in that. Not to mention all of the things that have opened our eyes to the passage of unconstitutional laws. It's not like we don't have a Harvard law grad from uh, serving in the governor's office. That's what he said. Of- <laughs> I, I ain't seen a Yale Harvard graduate lose more cases than I've seen this governor, but go ahead. <laughs> touche, touche. <laughs> the, the point being, you have lawyers who have gone through first level of constitutional law. They know what they're doing in the legislature as well as the governor. They know what uh, um, overbroad and vague uh, constitutional make something unconstitutional. They know what um, the what uh, majority minority maps are supposed to look like. They know that. But when they're using their platform to build a higher political, you know, fulfill their political aspirations versus serving the people, there's got to be an attorney general who stops that, who challenges it. You know, I, I, I often talk about when uh, the governor he asked the Supreme Court to issue an advisory opinion. I'm sorry, um, Madam Attorney General, why aren't you issuing an advisory opinion to be clear on what that is? So I'm gonna do an inspection of uh, of this legislation this year. I'm also gonna look back on it and I am going to make it very clear that I will never support unconstitutional um, legislation on behalf of the people. So it is engaging in lawsuits. It is engaging in the right lawsuits. It's it's doing an inspection of the the work that has been done by the legislature and the governor that harms the people. It has to do with um, getting in prosecutions for the consumer fraud, the issues, the environment and certainly supporting our laborers and the people who do the work for the state. Now, you mentioned this uh, a while ago, and I want to I want to talk about it. It's the uh, you know, it is a historic run. You were a historic figure in your own right. Um, But, you know, when I ran for this seat, I'm black and I never forgot it, but I didn't think about it that I was going to be the first black nominee until the day it happened. And a reporter asked me, what does it feel like to be the first black nominee? And I had not. I, most questions you're ready for, and I'm ready to hand out all what I'm a who I'm a sue and what I'm gonna do. And I remember looking at him, and I had no answer for it because I hadn't thought about it, and it hadn't hit me. And I know I don't know if you felt that when you got elected to be state attorney, but I I was running because I thought I was the best candidate, and I wanted to be attorney general. And it just so happened that I I got to be the first black one. But you know we got all these, we still got all these firsts in Florida because we've been governed by the same people that look like the same way. Uh, And I think that's part of the reason the people of the state of Florida don't know what it's like to have an attorney general that could actually do what they're supposed to do. That, in my opinion, is the most effective office for change there is in state government. And quick change. Like when people talk about a hundred, the first hundred days on the job, like we can do a lot of damage to injustice in the first hundred days. And that's exactly what I expect to do. But as it relates to your question, Sean, I, I can't believe we haven't talked about this before. I had the same exact right. um, experience. I was being interviewed, you know, trying to get as much um, earned media and get right. in front of people. And I remember with Scott Powers with Florida politics, he was like, so you're going to be the first African-American state attorney in the state of Florida. How does that feel? Right. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> um, I, I, first of all, I, I didn't know that, you know, and of course, who studies that type of information? And like you said, I was running because I believe we needed a voice for justice that we had not seen. Now, maybe that is why we hadn't seen it. But I, I was I was sure that my experience as an assistant public defender, as well as an assistant state attorney, um, having tried every type case on both sides from uh, suspended license to homicide, I knew that I was well prepared for it. Hearing the voice of the people working with the community, um, being on the ground, I knew that I was the right person for it. Once I, I don't know if you went through this, Sean, but once I realized it, it made me open up to all of the voices that I now, the, the weight of carrying that. And you know, like, I can't do all this in four years, right? You know, when you finally get there, there's culture shifts, there's um, impacts that you know that you have to have internally. There's going to be internal pushback with large offices when you're trying to make change. And then by the time you find out where the bathroom is, you know, you right. got to figure out re-election. So it's, 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 it's something that we have to recognize, but when you can get there, and this is what is so, I, I, we haven't talked about this yet either. You and I both have been able to blaze a trail 
for someone to come. So I was able to do that as the first black state attorney. I supported my successor, who is now who is a black woman too, doing building upon the work. Right, mm-hmm. you were the first um, black nominee for this position, and to have your support, you know that I'm so grateful for. I can't think of a time that I've called or texted that you haven't immediately taken it <laughs> or immediately hit back. This is how you start building it, and this is what it, 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 the people really need. Because, like you said. We don't know what this office means. We don't even yeah. know what justice looks like or the route to it. So I'm sure you experience this as well. But my campaign is not just about educating you on me. It's educating people on the position. And, and how powerful it is. And I, I often told people, I don't have to ask the governor's permission to file a lawsuit. Like I don't have to ask the legislature's permission to file a lawsuit. I can do that tomorrow. And there's no other job in the cabinet where you get to do that. And I, that's Absolutely. why I thought it was so powerful and uh, and it was, and it was so amazing. I, I want to talk about before I got to let you go. Cause I know you need to be raising money and doing all kind of good stuff. Um, talk about your bio, like where'd you come from? Where, why'd you get into the law? I know that is, we all come from somewhere and we all are willing to do what it takes to get into elected office, which is a lot, but there's a, something that drives us to do it. What's where are you, where are you coming from on that journey? Oh gosh, there's, there, there's so much. So I, um, you know, born and raised in Michigan, I saw the injustices um, and I saw both sides of it. You know, um, having had, you know, watch people be mistreated in the system and not get due process and no one say anything. But I, I, I have become more comfortable talking about Dion, um, my best friend in the 12th grade who was shot and killed by her boyfriend. And I sat in that courtroom after sitting at the funeral and knowing that we would do something different. So I've always been a a, um, fighter against gun violence. I've been personally impacted. I've always stood against domestic violence. Clearly, I've been personally impacted. And what we have to realize is that all of this push for criminal justice reform is certainly about due process, but you have not completed the conversation about reform until you talk about crime victims. It has to include us identifying what real crime victims look like, because while we may have an image of a, you know, 22 year old white college female, that that's the typical crime victim. The typical crime victim are black and brown males between the ages of 17 and 26. That's who we have to be supporting. So when the attorney general's office decides we're not going to, um, give victims compensation to people who have been, you know, previously convicted of a felony, that is, that's devastating um, to the idea of what victimization really looks like. And I want to make certain that I build upon, like you said, where I come from and fight for that like no one else will. I hear you. I love it. I'm going to have to let you go on that. I see, uh, I think our Zoom call is about to have some issues anyway, but I appreciate it, Aramis. I know you are running for statewide office is hard. And uh, trust me, I'm one of the few that know how hard what you're doing is. Everyone knows who's running for governor. It's those down ballot ones that are hard uh, to get people excited about, to get people to, to, to let you talk for five minutes after they've let everybody running for everything else talk. And I know it's hard and, um, and you're doing a great job at it. I want you to keep calling me whenever you need advice. And I know that the, I'm going to tell you a story, the higher office you run for, the less, uh, impact on your own life you have. And so when you run for higher office, people tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And I remember after I lost, uh, the race, I drove to Publix and went grocery shopping by myself and didn't ask nobody to do it. And it was the most glorious feeling I had had in like two years. (laughs) So I I want to tell you, you got, you got at least that to look forward to no matter what, but while you're in it, keep at it. It's a lot riding on it. It's an important office. It gets more important all the time considering Roe versus Wade and what this state is going to be doing. I imagine to ban abortion, uh, what this state is doing at the legislative level. We need you. We need an attorney general like you, and I know you're going to be amazing. So keep Thank at it. Thank you so much, Sean. I yes, appreciate ma'am. you. All, All right. right. Thank you. Take it easy. Welcome to another episode of Vanguards of Democracy. This is Sean. Sean, I'm here with Reverend J.C. Pritchett. Reverend, thank you for coming by. Um, We have had some guests today, in fact, where I've been talking about the tenor of political conversations in this country and how they have changed from a level of 
we can agree to disagree about policy to a level where we are now um, of we don't even listen to the other side if it's not saying what we want to say. Um, and that's just not good for our country. You are the president of an organization where I think we're going to try to make the argument is maybe the one place where we can have some of these types of discussions. And that's the Tiger Bay Club. And I want you to describe kind of what Tiger Bay is, specifically what Suncoast Tiger Bay is. And firstly, I want to acknowledge that you are the first African-American president of the Suncoast Tiger Bay Club. And the first black person to do anything uh, is a big deal. And we need to acknowledge it and recognize it because it means something. Uh, and the fact that it took till 2020 something to do it means it ain't easy. And so I want to congratulate you on that. But tell us, what is Tiger Bay for those in the audience that don't know it? And why do you think it can be the place for us to have some of these discussions without people, like you said, getting in their feelings so much? Thanks, man. I have to start with my mother. From Montgomery, Alabama, with 12 children. Can you imagine growing up with 12 aunts and uncles and their spouses? There has to be conversation about meals and sharing a restroom and vacations and family reunions. And so I like to approach a situation at the table to see what do we agree on? Where can we agree and work from there? It's easy. It's very easy for us to talk about what we don't agree on and, and to, to go into our separate corners, our separate niches, our separate um, gangs and divisions. But it takes a conscious effort and, and a thinker and a lover of people to find places to work together, even when we don't agree. And so my day job is president of Interdenominational Ministry Alliance. Over 100 years, former African-American clergy. When I took over three years ago, I said, we're going to be black, white, Jew, Muslim, gay, and straight. Because in Tampa Bay and in Florida, we cannot improve our communities unless there are broad coalitions and broad um, teams and concepts built, regardless of our doctrine or our theology, we have to work together. Particularly clergy. Yeah. And let me tell you, it's nothing like telling some moderate conservative black folks that here comes the, yeah. And so it is also nothing like getting Christian and Jews to, so, so that's, that's the teaching of life. Life is full of interactions at work and in, in our places of worship and at, at, at the Starbucks line of different people. So Tiger Bay is that space where People of different parties can meet on a regular basis, hear speakers, discuss topics, and engage over the meal. And that's part of our faith. Our faith is all around a meal, all around a table, having communion, having conversation, having dialogue, seeing what can we do together and who we are as people. And so Tiger Bay is one of the few places where every month these diverse groups of people are having dialogue. Why, what made you get involved in the Suncoast Tiger Bay Club? I was involved, um, what, 88, registered to vote for the first time, and I was involved in, in politics, involved in campaigns. My um, professor in community college was running for city council. I was his campaign manager. So I was always involved in the process. I think it's very important to be involved in the process. And even when I joined the ministry, I really realized after living in D.C. for 10 years that if you ever put the pulpit and policy together to help our people, then you can create change. And that's one of the things about Dr. King. Dr. King. When he got killed, he was talking about people's money. He saw the, the black and brown bodies being killed in Vietnam. And so that's what got folks' attention. As long as he was talking about a dream and hugging black kids and hugging white kids and uh, sharing a Happy Meal, it was fine. It was poverty that got yeah, killed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so um, Tiger Bay is the place in our community where you can join and be involved in the process. And so uh, when I moved back to St. Petersburg after 10 years in D.C., got involved in the club again, eventually got on the board of directors and eventually got in line to be president. And so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Describe, we're, we take it for granted, but yeah, yeah. describe a lunch, because Tiger Bay is, is a lunch meeting group. Describe a Tiger Bay lunch. What does it look like? What does a partisan look like? How do the question, because this is, there's a reason why it works. Yeah. It's interesting that, uh, you know, the Tampa Club meets around the corner here in Ybor City, but our club traditionally meets at the St. Petersburg Yacht Club. So when you talk about the murder of George Floyd and you talk about how woke people are and Black Lives Matter and how inclusive we are, you're literally talking about a place that until very recently, African-Americans and women and Jews were not welcome. And that's just a fact. I belong to the Yacht Club. I belong to the Country Club. I love me some Country Club living. But the fact is, that's the meeting place. 
The meeting begins at 1130 and runs to 130. So I'm saying that because you and I are aware of what Tiger Bay is, but it's a place of privilege. Who can leave work for an hour and a half once a month and take a meeting and spend $25 or $35? So I'm not, I think that we have to be truthful about what it was. What we've done is we have met at many different venues this year. We met at the James Museum. Our next meeting is going to be at the St. Petersburg History Museum. The April meeting, we, the May meeting, we met at University of South Florida, St. Pete campus. There are beautiful places in the St. Petersburg community to meet. And because we're at the Suncoast Tiger Bay Club, we cover all of Powers County. So there are places throughout the county to meet. But meeting allows people to see different venues, to be in different spaces. And when you're reaching out to younger uh, potential members and you're reaching out to black and brown folks, it's very important where you meet, how welcome you feel, what you see what food you eat, what music you hear. And all of that has been changed this year. The music that you hear when you arrive, the food that you, you eat, the environment is different because we're trying to create a conversation for a dialogue that can be very stressful and, and very uh, full of drama and, and full of uh, challenges. And so once you do the setting, I use this example for church all the time, a, a, a parking lot, a clean restroom, and a greeting usher makes it easier for the minister. And so we're creating an environment where the environment is friendly. The music's great. The food's great. Let's have a conversation. Tell me, tell us how the conversation works. So we're, you're there at the meeting spot. What? L- let me give you a topic. What the topic might be? Um, <clears throat> Roe v. Wade may be overturned. Oh, Jeez. I mean, there's tough. Tiger Bay has tough topics, right? Yeah. Uh, if well, that's the topic, <clears throat> mm-hmm. tell me how you might address that at a Tiger Bay club. Who your speakers might be? Don't not by name, but like title and party and all yeah, that. Yeah. So right now. We're, we're coming back after a year of being shut down because of COVID. And so people are excited to be in person again. So we have our panel. We start at lunch at 1130. At noon, the program starts. And we have our panel. After the panel conversation, is a period of question and answer for members only. So that's why we say welcome to the Tigers Den, because there's great honor and privilege in winning the award if you have the best question. Oh, and the questions are yeah. never and tougher so than... The, 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 the intention is to be challenging, but be respectful. Some people got a speech, and I don't do that. I'm, we're not doing speeches. We're not doing ask your question because we have brought great content to our membership this year and in past years, to be honest. And you need to hear from the speakers and then ask your question with intelligence without a gotcha moment or without trying to you know impress your spouse. And so if I was doing a Roe versus Wade, of course, I would have to find some activists, some people from uh, some, some attorneys. Some, some young college students, some mothers, um, you know, it's, it's and what you're describing is a panel from all sides yeah. of the issue. Though. Yeah. And you know how deep that, that conversation should be. And that's why we have to do this with attention. I could be a part of that conversation because, you know, my son graduated from college last week, but the year before he was born, we lost a daughter. And so we haven't had conversations about, especially as men, as black men, the difficulty of having children. Uh, the specialists that are are needed sometimes. And so if if you, mental health, support groups, all the system that you need when you lose a child. Uh, And so we lost a child one year, conceived, and had my son within a year. Where I'm from, I'm trying to have a baby. I'm from the child's part. I'm from the hood. I did not have the resources to know that maybe my wife needed some mental health assistance. Maybe we should have joined a support group. Maybe we should have reached out to others who had the same experience to help us. I didn't, we didn't have it. And so that's why I shared this story. And I shared this story because there are some people who have health reasons why they have to consider this option. It, you know, we have, we have used this, you know, out on the town, had a good time, got knocked up. Right. Which is not true. That, there, is, that is the vast minority, minority. There of are, people that exercise choice. There are, let me tell you this. When the doctor comes in and shows you something on the screen that is predicting what uh, health and life your child may have, that's a conversation that's mature that is not the same as some young girl that you're saying got knocked up or some well, all the, you know, all the stories they've done. And that, that's, what's, that's what's disrespectful to us as Americans and disrespectful to this country we're trying to build. These are conversations that you have to have with your rabbi or your priest or your family that you have to pray about, you have to contemplate. And the people who are making these decisions about a woman's body have privilege and power and wealth that they have all options open. And they are making judgments about people who they have had no contact with. 
you remember that time when George uh, Bush was in line to check out Stan, and he 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 wasn't sure what the uh, the scanner was, and there was some confusion about that. Yeah. And we always do this thing during elections: how much is a gallon of milk? We need people in public policy who know how much a gallon of milk is, how, what a, what a gallon of gas costs, and what it's like to make a decision with your spouse about making health decisions for your family. We can play this easy game of you're right. You're, you're wrong, I'm right, and, and, and be at polar opposites. But that's not life. Life is a baseball game, a football game, a hockey game, rooting for your team, weekends at the beach, throwing hor- horseshoes and flying a kite. It's the simple things that unite us. It's meals around the table with the people that you love. It's having a drink after work with your buddy. This is what we are. We are not these enemies who hate each other and, and, and want to destroy each other. I, first of all, I agree with everything you said. Uh, And it's the reason that I believe we have to talk about these things. When you don't talk about them, one, your stances get radical because you're not listening to other people. So even if you start here, you end up in crazy places. And also, you need to listen to people. People need to listen to you. And I don't think in this country we are at that place at all. You got your thing, and that's it. Everybody else is wrong for whatever reason. And that's why Tiger Bay, that's why I wanted to bring up how it works and what it works because in a Roe v. Wade discussion, I would imagine you would have someone that is extremely pro-life. You would have someone who's extremely pro-choice. You'd you'd have preachers. You'd have someone that had that exercise the choice. You'd have the gamut, and they got to talk to each other in a respectful manner and listen to questions that are hard. When I was at my the last Tiger Baby, I remember being at when I was up on the hard podium. It was when Black Lives Matter stuff was going on. I was running for office. And someone asked me, they prefaced this with, they believed all lies were important. And why was I pointing this out? And uh, why do you believe black lives matter? You understand my blood pressure immediately got high. And I got, I was, I flashed with anger. I could feel myself getting red, but I understood that this person wasn't asking that question to be a jerk. This was an older white guy that I thought was asking the question because he wanted a legitimate answer and a point of view that he wanted to know why I believed it. And I gave him the answer. And that's what Tiger Bay is. It's a place that we need to have more of because it doesn't exist right now. You know, it's funny. There was a time when the 25 cent uh, wings and the two for one drinks, the happy hour was a big deal. You took your business card, you met people, people interacted. And we don't do that enough. Right. And for black folks, we were going home. And 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 we missed, we found out later that on the golf course and at over drinks. Yeah, the meeting and, after the yeah, meeting. Yeah, exactly. So so um, just imagine how many spaces we can we need to create. So there's conversations about marriage, about life, about being in love, about raising children, about uh, all of the issues of the day. And so Tiger Bay serves that purpose. I'm sure there are some other clubs and organizations that seek for that, but we have responsibility also to create spaces with people who don't look like us or live where we live to have dialogue and have conversation and to, and to interact. Intentionally, we have to do that. Our, our responsibility, when I say our, I mean everybody, is to listen to and oh, yeah, to be yeah. open to listening. That's hard these days. That is hard these days to, because uh, you want to react like I wanted to react yeah. to that Black Lives Matter question. Yeah. You got to sit and listen and not assume bad intentions. Uh, and it, that's hard to do. I know it's hard to do. Well, the with age, I am finding, yeah, it, it, I'm like, too. you can't tear the store up all the time. And, you know, it, it's very easy to stereotype people and in, in to make general statements, but there's a, t- I don't want to be preach a sermon, but there's a text that I love in the New Testament. It says that, that Jesus came and dwelt among them. And this is hard for some people to digest, especially moderate and conservative people. I'm not going to include the fundamentalists, but Jesus dwelt among them. Jesus dwelt among fishermen and prostitutes and regular people, regular folks. When is the last time you dwelt among them? When is the last time you went to a bar or to to a public golf course or to Walmart and just listen to people and see how people interact? I do this all the time. I don't know if you do this. I was flying in last week and I was waiting to be picked up at the airport. I watch the people who get picked up to see who kiss who embrace, who don't even talk, who has a dog in the car, who has children who are running to greet them, just to see people have the traveling, missing flights, eating airplane food, doing business, doing whatever it was they're doing, but coming back home, how they're greeted. And let me tell you, it's a bad feeling when there's no one to greet you. I, I, I hate to be picked up late, but there's something about when my wife and my son picks me up from the airport, 
seeing them and being energized and reminding myself why it is what we do what we do. And so we need to spend more time watching people and listening to people and see how they, they act. But I think we also have to check people and call people out. The reason that Black Lives Matter is because a white boy can go into a grocery store and shoot black folks with a gun that he got legally. Black Lives Matter because and in this, walk out, yeah, and handcuffed. Well, and then the, the 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 kid before was you know waving at the cops and stuff in, in Wisconsin that he traveled to because he was a, right. a hero to save uh, the people there in Wisconsin and the, the 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 team in Georgia who saw the black man checking out um, Mr. Arbery checking out a new development and jogging through the neighborhood and decided it was their duty to chase him down and to shoot him down like an animal and to be in contact with the district attorney. That's why Black Lives Matter because in this country from day one. A system was created in order to create wealth and privilege for white men, landowners, on the backs of black and brown people. And unless you acknowledge that, I mean, I'm sorry, you have a head start. You have some advantages. Your people love black women. I know it because look at my skin. There are people having sex with black women creating this new skin tone. I mean, these are all facts. And if you want to take it out of school, it's a reason you want to take it out of school. If you want to talk about uh, don't say gay, there's a reason you want to talk about don't say gay. There's a, there's a master plan of evil. And if we keep passively uh, standing by, pretending that it's going to be all right, we're kidding ourselves. Well, there's someone that wants us all fighting amongst ourselves oh, yeah. about BS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we yeah. don't understand That's the master the distraction. plan. Yeah. But I, you, know, you, you said you didn't want to preach a sermon and brought it up. But you know, people love to selectively talk about the Bible Mm -hmm. and the constitution of the United States. If you read both of them, the things that you just said won't seem radical. They won't seem weird. They're in the text. The text talks about Jesus dwelling amongst us. I don't tell you, it talks about clothing the naked, feeding the hungry. Yeah. It talks about prison, talks Uh, about a lot of things that uh, we don't do today for uh, uh, the the least of us. Let's say that. Uh, And the constitution of the United States uh, clearly, you know, you and I were considered less than, one of one. We were considered three-fifths of a person uh, in the Constitution and women couldn't vote. So women couldn't hold property, neither yeah. could slaves or black people. This is not us being weird. Yeah. This is what the country is founded it's, on. It's now, the- we've got, we've come a long way, but we certainly ain't come far enough if you see what's going on in these times, if you also see that how we are allowing these divisions to get the best of us. And, and hence the je- jelly beans, but... Yeah, I do want to talk about This is very recent. I'm 53 years old, Sean. The fact is, is that just the other day, Malcolm and King and Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy were killed. Just the other day, the Civil Rights Act was passed. We're still begging for the John, Wright, John Lewis Voting Rights Act to pass. We're still bailing out banks, but not those with student loan debt. I mean, and so what we have to do as progressives or as thinkers or as Democrats, whatever your, your label is, is fight. We have to, we have to realize that they're good at this game. This is not just the Lee Atwater game. This is a game that was created in 1619. And that their game is to win, and there's a strategy to win, and we keep hugging trees and, and singing folk songs and getting defeated. And we don't have the... There's not going to be a do-over. This is it. Gospel songs and T-shirts ain't going to fight. Yeah, this ain't going to win this battle. I agree with you. Because the other side isn't fighting like that. No. We're getting to the end, though. Talk about this. I keep those jelly beans on my desk, and I just thought about this driving over from St. Pete to Tampa. The jelly beans on on my desk to remind me that just 50 plus years ago in the Deep South, Jim Crow supervisor elections officers asked people of color to to count the number, to guess the number of jelly beans in order to have their right to vote. Today, that's silly, right? Well, you know what? That's just silly. Telling churches you can't use your church vans to take people to vote because you may lose your status. What's silly is telling people you can't give someone a glass of water are lying standing after standing in line. line to vote after you've taken voting uh, precincts from their neighborhoods. That's what's silly. What's silly is that the black people have to keep going to Congress asking for their right to vote. That's what's silly. What's silly is that we, we live in a country where instead of letting everyone vote, the best man win, you, you have your issues, your policy, the best man or woman wins, that we come up with systems and elect people who will steal. You understand what I'm saying to you? Of course you know this. These white boys went to the Capitol, kicked the door in, tried to hang someone, kidnap someone, and kill someone, and people were killed. And then they say, according to RNC, it was just, you know, some... It was peaceful protest. Peaceful protest. But the black folks the year before who were in front of the Capitol... Riots and thugs. Yeah, yeah. Why didn't you shoot them? Why can't we just shoot them? 
In fact, President Trump at the time said, yeah. why can't you just shoot these guys yeah. for thugs? Yeah. That's what he said to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice at the time while he was President of the United States. Um, brother, I appreciate you coming on, man. You came with the thunder here. Uh, I appreciate it. I want to come to one of your meetings because yeah. I bet... Ooh, boy. I bet you have a good one. We need to have you over there. <laughs> I'll come. You good? Have me over there. I love it. But man, I appreciate it. Congratulations. Uh, they elected a good one uh, over there at the Suncoast Tiger Bay Club. We appreciate it, man. Vanguards of Democracy is funded and produced by Vanguard Attorneys, a local personal injury law firm serving the Tampa Bay area with ingenuity and an indomitable work ethic. Don't forget to follow Vanguards of Democracy on YouTube or download episodes on your favorite podcast streaming services like iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And lastly, we're excited to announce that we're launching our new landing page, www.vanguardsofdemocracy.com, where you'll be able to ask questions, recommend guests or topics, and stay up to date with news and announcements. It'll be great. If you know how to bookmark a website, this is the one that'll make it worth it. Thank you.